London. Behind the bright lights, there's a dark side to this city you won't find in a typical travel guide. London is probably the most haunted city in Europe. Ghosts are said to prowl these streets. They're spirits haunting even the city's most famous places. Why is the Tower of London so haunted? Quite simply because there's been so much horror there. Terrifying spirits of royals roam the castles. The ghost at Hampton Court Palace is still not fully explained. Creepy commoners haunt the pubs. The noises, the knocks, the things turn themselves off. There's no explanation. And the victims of the notorious Jack the Ripper refuse to be forgotten. Catherine's ghost is seen here, her body mutilated as it was when Jack the Ripper left her. These chilling tales are only some of the reasons you will want to watch your back the next time you walk the streets of London. London is famous for its grand castles, palaces, and history that reaches back over 2,000 years. But what may not be known are the chilling and dark stories of hauntings behind many of its iconic locations. The Tower of London is one place full of frightening tales that cannot be explained. This fortress was built as a palace for the king and also served as a jail. But it's torture and executions that make this castle so haunted. Richard Jones is a London ghost historian and writer. He says, if you're looking for ghosts, there's nothing quite like the Tower of London. The Tower of London is probably not only one of the most haunted places in London, it's probably the most haunted building in the whole of Britain. Why is the Tower of London so haunted? Quite simply because there's been so much horror there, so many horrible things. Guards, staff, and even tourists have reported terrifying visions of headless corpses, ghostly figures, and even the spirits of children. Generally, most of the tower is haunted, the White Tower especially, which was used to keep prisoners. I would also imagine where the execution block actually stood would be haunted. But most of the tower, the battlements, they're said to be soldiers roaming the battlements, ghostly soldiers. But it's the royals executed here whose spirits have been most often reported to be lurking in the tower's dark corners. One queen reported to haunt these walls is Anne Boleyn, the second wife of the infamous King Henry VIII. Anne Boleyn's ghost roams the Tower of London because that's where she was kept prisoner before she was executed. Many people have felt her ghost rather than seen it and complained about it over the years. There have been apparently many sightings. Anne's journey from queen to ghost is a sad and tragic tale. Henry VIII married her after divorcing his first wife, who failed to produce any male heirs. But the second time wasn't the charm. Anne gave birth to only one girl and suffered three miscarriages. Then, rumors began to fly that Anne was having multiple affairs. She was arrested and charged with treason, adultery, and even incestuous relations with her brother. Henry had to get rid of Anne Boleyn because she wasn't producing the all-important male heir which he really needed to continue the dynasty. So there were charges which were trumped up. Anne was imprisoned in the Tower of London, tried and quickly found guilty. On May 19th, 1536, less than three weeks after her arrest, she was taken outside the White Tower and put to death. And she then just knelt down and the swordsman just brought up the sword and just removed the head in one. And it's said that uh, her lips were still muttering when her, when her head had been removed from her body with her final prayer. Scholars agree Anne was almost certainly innocent of the charges. That may explain why her spirit wanders the corridors, startling all those to whom she reveals herself. People have actually claimed to have seen her ghost. They have said that she carries her head under her arm and she is like a grey shadow. Specific hauntings of the Tower of London attributed to Anne Boleyn include a very uh, strange one from the 19th century where a sentry was on duty and he saw a figure coming towards him and he challenged the figure and the figure kept on coming. The guard commanded the figure to halt, but the apparition scared him stiff. 
and the man fainted. He was then uh, threatened with court-martial for dereliction of duty because they thought he'd, he'd been drinking and passed out on duty. But fortunately for him, two people came to his rescue and said they'd actually seen that figure from the windows. Uh, and a lot of the sort of uh, accounts of the day say it was recognizable as Anne Boleyn. Historians record that Anne was beheaded outside the White Tower, but that was an exception to the rule. Royal executions typically took place in a grassy courtyard inside the fortress called the Tower Green. It wouldn't do for the royals to mix company with commoners, even in death. Beheading was considered one of the most humane ways of killing a prisoner, and for this reason it was reserved for noble prisoners. Um, Really, if you had an executioner who knew what he was doing and you had a very sharp axe, you could get it all over with very quickly. But there are always exceptions to the rule. The execution of the Countess Margaret Pole is a grim reminder of how gruesome beheading can be as a form of capital punishment. Her ghost is said to terrify visitors to this day. Her chilling screams echo through the hallways. Margaret Pohl's ghost is not resting. Apparently it is said to wander the tower, especially around the area where she was executed. Her crime was simply being the mother of a cardinal accused of taking part in an uprising against Henry VIII. The cardinal was safely abroad and out of Henry's reach. His mother was not. The countess was killed for her so-called involvement in this plot. However, she protested her innocence from the very beginning to her very last breath. Henry VIII was the one who ordered her to be executed. When the day finally came for Margaret Pole to meet her maker, the 67-year-old countess was taken to the Tower Green. But according to the story, she wasn't quite ready to die. Anne Boleyn got off easy with one swift chop from her executioner. The countess wasn't so lucky. There's two stories. One, that the executioner pushed her roughly down on the block, and in annoyance, he hit her with the ax, but it didn't hit her neck, it hit her shoulder, and it took 10 blows to finish the job. The other story is that she refused to lay down at all, and that the executioner chased her around the block, hacking her as he went, and it took 11 blows to finish the job. Either way, after such a grisly death, the Countess has found revenge by haunting the tower. There are claims her ghost has been seen frantically running round Tower Green, pursued by her executioner. There have been some stories about the execution being repeated on the anniversary, but the most common thing is that the shadow of an axe is said to uh, appear upon one of the walls of the White Tower on the anniversary of her execution. People who've seen ghosts say that most of them are like grey shadows. I think her ghost is the same, a grey shadow, something that's not quite opaque, something you can slightly see through, but you can see that it's the form of a person, definitely. Like a negative on a photograph. The Tower of London is not just one building. It is a sprawling complex of several different towers and structures. It's believed one section, called the Bloody Tower, was the location of a horrific murder two children killed in a power struggle for the throne. One of their ghosts is still waiting to be king. The story of the two princes in the tower is one of the most evocative and mysterious of all of these stories. Their murder was all about power and a desire to get it. In 1483, 12-year-old Edward V and his 10-year-old brother were brought to the tower in preparation for Edward's coronation. But their uncle, Richard, wanted the throne for himself and found a way to declare Edward an illegitimate heir. Richard was crowned king, but he knew some might insist his nephew had a claim to the throne. Edward would be a threat as long as he and his brother were alive. And shortly thereafter, the princes disappeared, and nobody actually ever found out what had become of them. The rumor always was that Richard had them murdered. The two children simply vanished from the tower, but their spirits did not. They are perhaps the most pathetic ghosts of the Tower of London because they're seen there shaking and shivering and weeping, and they're backing slowly towards the wall. And all those who see them are moved to want to go and give them assistance and comfort. People say that they see their ghosts like shadows, coming towards them with their arms outstretched, pleading for help, and that as soon as they reach out to touch them, that they fade away. 
The Tower isn't the only place in London where royals wander in the afterlife. Hampton Court Palace was a former residence to kings and queens. And if you believe this startling video, still is. If you're looking for ghosts, the Tower of London is at the top of the list of places to see in this haunted city. But London has another piece of royal real estate where eerie encounters have been reported for centuries. Hampton Court Palace was the home of kings and queens until 1737, and it is one of London's most popular tourist destinations. Just don't visit after dark. Hampton Court's got a lot of living in it and a lot of dying in it as well. Over the years, there have been numerous tales of grisly supernatural occurrences at the palace. Ghastly screams heard in the middle of the night, wraith-like figures running down hallways. For many, these tales were simply campfire ghost stories until they saw this startling video. In 2003, a strange event was caught on a Hampton Court Palace security camera that made headlines around the world. Two alleyway doors mysteriously started to open and shut. The security cameras, the CCTV at Campton Court, which is focused on a particular fire escape door, picked up a very strange image. On two nights consecutively, the door flew open. It went very, very quickly. This former royal palace is well known for hauntings, but no one had ever seen anything quite like this. Then, on the third day, the camera captured more than just the doors opening. A macabre figure closed them. The footage of the ghost caught on CCTV at Hampton Court is quite fascinating. It shows a figure wearing what at first glance appears to be a, a, a fur coat, wrestling with the, with the doors, holding the bars, trying to get through the doors. When they looked closer at it, it had the appearance of a skeleton. It got the nickname Skeletor. The mystery deepened when it was discovered no one on staff was ever near the fire doors or claimed to shut them. A really good friend of mine was a curator at Hampton Court when that happened, um, and she said there's no explanation for it. It's, it's incredible. Hampton Court was built in 1488, and it was Henry VIII who was the first king to move in. And just like at the Tower of London, Henry's sordid love life left Hampton Court with a legacy of ghosts. Legend has it, two of his six wives have been skulking around this palace for centuries, terrifying all those who see or just feel their presence. One of them is Jane Seymour. The third wife of Henry died less than two weeks after giving him the male heir he so desperately wanted. Her ghost is now said to be seen around various parts of the palace, and a sort of a weeping, wailing ghost, uh, obviously lamenting the fact that, although she's the mother of the king, she died before she could uh, see her son really grow up to the world. She gave birth in a room at the top of the silver stairs. It is reputed that she floats down those stairs, and she goes out into clock court towards the rooms of her son with a lighted candle in her hand. She is going to spend eternity ever looking for that son. But Jane has company as she searches for her son, the ghost of Catherine Howard. Catherine was Henry's fifth wife, but the king spilled her blood when he discovered she had eyes for another man. Catherine Howard's a very intriguing figure. She was still a teenager when she uh, married Henry VIII, and don't forget, by this time, Henry had changed. She'd gone from being the princely, the uh, athletic type, to being a, a, a really a, a horrendous, fat, bloated man in his 50s. Catherine and Henry were married for only a year. When gossip flew around town, she was having an affair with one of Henry's close staff. It's easy to understand why Catherine didn't find her rotund king that sexy and why the gossip was true. Catherine Howard was tried for adultery against the king and therefore as also being a traitor. Now she was imprisoned in Hampton Court and while she was imprisoned in Hampton Court, shortly before her execution, she escaped from her jailers. So she went racing through what is now called the Haunted Gallery and banged on the chapel door, begging to be heard by her husband. And Henry is said to have sat in there stony-faced and not even moved or flinched. 
Catherine's pleas went unheard. She was taken to the Tower of London, and another of Henry's wives would meet the blade of an executioner's axe. But her ghost returned to Hampton Court Palace. Her screams for mercy have terrified many who have encountered her. And it is said that her ghost stalks those corridors, screaming as she screamed, on practically on a nightly basis. Catherine Howard's ghost is sometimes seen racing through what is now known as the Haunted Gallery at Hampton Court. And she's at reputedly making that final attempt that she made in life to try and get mercy from the king and save her life. In fact, there's a very famous postcard Hampton Court used to put out in the, I think it was in the 1930s, which showed her ghost streaming through the haunted gallery. Could this 2003 security camera video be proof of Jane Seymour or Catherine Howard haunting our world? To this day, no one can say yes or no. If royalty is Britain's most popular export, then pubs come in a close second. And at some pubs in London, the word spirits means more than just a shot of whiskey. There's something here, and I try to look for a logical answer, and sometimes you just can't find one. But of all the terrifying tales from London's past, there is only one that delivers blood-curdling fear with just a name. Jack. Hampton Court Palace and the Tower of London are full of frightening tales. But the royals don't have a monopoly when it comes to ghosts in this city. Spectres and spirits can be found all over and from all walks of life. It turns out London's pubs are where the ghosts of common folk haunt us from beyond the grave. Unnerving noises in the cellars, glasses that mysteriously move, or taps that shut themselves off. Who knew the pub was a perfect place to grab a pint and a poltergeist? It's the place where people went to drown their sorrows. And there's an old Irish saying that ghosts only appear in places that know neither great happiness or great sadness. And if you think about it, the pubs of London have known both in abundance. Decades of memories, both happy and sad, have seeped into the walls of many London pubs. The Grenadier is one place where you can find both. The building was constructed in 1720 and used as the barracks at officers' mess. But this pub became famous for more than just food and drink. The spirits of dead soldiers decided they never wanted to leave, and their grim ghosts remain. I would say the Grenadier is one of the most haunted pubs in London. It's been part of the community, part of London life for over 300 years. So if you think about it, it's had plenty of time to amass a lot of stories, a lot of anecdotes, and also a lot of ghosts. It turns out when soldiers weren't eating and drinking at the Grenadier, they were gambling. One story goes that an officer was caught cheating in the middle of a heated card game. This didn't go over too well with his opponents who beat him to death just outside the pub. The officer was killed when he was caught cheating at cards. Uh, we don't know exactly when it was. We don't know exactly who he was. And he's since gained the name of Cedric, uh, is what they call their ghost here. Cedric has haunted the Grenadier for years, but his ghost is never seen. Instead, this card cheat is what's known as a residual haunting. Patrons hear his ominous, plodding footsteps in empty rooms and see objects being slowly dragged back and forth. Stories about ghosts like Cedric are little more than tall tales, until you meet someone with first-hand experience. Tony Whitehead is the landlord and manager of the Grenadier. He had been on the job for only a day when he had a bone-chilling encounter he'll never forget. Well, it was my first week in, in here, and I went down into the cellar, and I was by myself. And I felt my shirt being tugged, and I thought it was somebody behind me. So I looked, and there was nobody there. And um, I just looked at my shirt, nothing, and then I just carried on. And the second time, I actually saw my shirt getting pulled like this, and I sort of jumped and looked, and I, f I, f I thought I felt the back of my neck being touched, and the hairs on my neck have stood up. Did Tony go one-on-one -on -one with Cedric or some other spirit who has found a home at the Grenadier? He doesn't know for sure, but this creepy confrontation has convinced him his pub is haunted. There's something here, but I don't know. I couldn't explain because I, I, I do find peculiar things happen here, and I try to look for a logical answer, and sometimes you just can't find one. 
The Grenadier is hardly the only pub in town to be haunted. At the Bow Bells in East London, there's a well-known ghost that's become legendary for the way it interacts with patrons. The ghost has been around. The story that we've heard is about 50 years, and the hauntings mainly happen throughout the building. There's noises and strange things happen in the cellar of the pub as well. This ghost isn't shy and has one unusual way to communicate with our world. The ghost in the ladies is called the phantom flusher because all it does is flushes the toilet when women sit on it. Pulling down toilet handles isn't the phantom's only trick. It makes other strange knocking noises. When you hear a knock, it'd just be a knock on like the door, and it'd be coming from that end of the pub, and you look, go to the ladies, which is locked, nothing there, and the gents, there's nothing there, and then you just come back, you'd be sorting stuff out, and then you hear another knock, and there's no explanation for it. It's quite scary. But it's the female customers who have to endure the most personal encounters with this spirit, because it's in the ladies' restroom where the phantom flusher got his name and where Kay Dickens had a chilling experience she'll never forget. One night, God, it's scary thinking about it again, because there's chills. Um, I went into the restrooms and pushed both doors and couldn't open them, so I'm waiting. I think both are occupied, and I made the toilet flushes. Kay waits to enter the stall, and waits, and waits. Door don't open. I'm waiting, and I go, are you right in there? You, you OK? And I push the door a bit, they don't open, and I think, oh, no, I'm getting worried. Would you think someone's, you know, ill? And then I push it again, and it opens, and there's nothing there. Nobody there. The mysterious experience at the Bow Bell's toilet has baffled Kay for years. Ultimately, she thinks there is only one explanation. It definitely must have been the ghost. There's no reason why I couldn't get into into that cubicle, and then even if you forget about it, can't push the door open, why did that toilet flush? But this ghost isn't content just flushing toilets in the women's stalls. Aaron Wilson has found his beer taps inexplicably shut off when he opens up the pub. Someone, or something, turns off the valves. This is the pub cellar where we've experienced the phantom flusher down here as well. And these are the valves where the ghost has turned them off. They're always left on. There's no reason for us to turn them off. And in the mornings, they'd be down for some reason. And there's no reason for any member of staff to turn them off at night. So who is the ghost behind all the mischief at the Bow Bells pub? You'd think a male spirit would get the biggest kick flushing out the ladies. But Aaron Wilson thinks this he may be a she. I think the ghost could be a girl because it, the behavior of flushing the toilet, turning things on and off, is quite childlike. When we've looked at the land registry for the pub, there was servants, domestic servants, and at that time they would have been young children. And the stairs are quite crooked and old here, and it's possible maybe one got killed, it's fallen down, and she just haunts the pub ever since. The true identity of the Phantom Flusher may be a mystery, but no one needs to convince Aaron that his pub is haunted. And in here, all the going-ons, the noises, the knocks, the things turning itself off, there's no explanation, so it has, for me, that's caused my belief in ghosts and my proof. But there are things in London much more frightening than the Phantom Flusher. The grisly killings of Jack the Ripper are well known, but few may be aware of the spirits this serial killer left behind. With such violent ends, you're going to inevitably get people talking about ghosts being seen. And a team of paranormal investigators explore one of the world's most haunted theaters. But these ghosts aren't looking for any new friends. Are you touching Barry? You take it off me, please. OK, that's enough now. I don't feel well. Westminster, Covent Garden, Chelsea, Notting Hill. Each of these London neighborhoods has a distinctive character made famous over the centuries. But it's Whitechapel in London's East End, where you might encounter the ghosts of one of the most gruesome crime sprees of all time. For three months in 1888, Jack the Ripper terrorized Whitechapel and all of London. 
The murders are well documented, but few know the stories of the phantoms that haunt these streets, petrifying locals and tourists, leaving them paralyzed with fear. There are several local traditions about the ghosts of Jack the Ripper's victims. Uh, obviously, with such violent ends, you are going to inevitably get people talking about ghosts being seen. I think this area is very haunted because of these terrible murders. Because let's face it, these women died absolutely horrifically. So it's not a surprise that they haunt the area. Newspapers at the time reported the grisly details of the five women who were savagely butchered. Jack the Ripper fascinates people to this day for several reasons. Uh, first and foremost, of course, it, it, it's, it's an unsolved mystery, and people love an unsolved mystery. Secondly, it connects us back to Victorian times, to the London of gaslight and fog. In the late 1800s, Whitechapel was a crowded slum, filled with people living on the streets in desperate circumstances. The Ripper preyed on a population that few might notice missing. There were 1,500 prostitutes here, which of course were easy picking for a killer like Jack the Ripper. Any prostitute would go to any out of the way darkened place with a client, making them an easy prospect. Jenny Phillips has been giving Jack the Ripper walking tours in Whitechapel for 17 years. Today, these modern streets are a far cry from the grim alleys and tenements where the Ripper stalked his prey. But cleaning up the streets doesn't mean you can clean out the ghosts. The ghoulish spirit of the Ripper's second victim, Annie Chapman, is said to still rove the location where she was murdered. It was here in Whitechapel in 1888 that Jack the Ripper murdered Annie Chapman. She was found in what is now the car park of Truman's Brewery. Her body was found up here, not far from that white pillar. She had been terribly mutilated. He also removed her womb, took it away with him, and he removed two brass rings from her finger and took those. They were never found. It was the surgical-like cuts on Annie Chapman's body that cemented the Ripper's image. They led police to believe this killer may have been a medical professional. And so Jack the Ripper entered the public consciousness as this figure in the top hat, the swirling cape, and the one item of apparel he's not without in any film, that shiny black doctor's bag. Many claim to have had eerie encounters with Annie's ghost on the anniversary of her death. She reportedly stalks the area near this parking lot. Even though the buildings here have changed dramatically since 1888, it appears that Annie's ghost does not realize that. She still haunts the particular area where her body was found. There is even a report that Annie's startling apparition floated into the offices of this brewery during a board meeting. Annie's ghost has been regularly seen over the years. She has been seen when there was offices here before. She was seen coming through the wall of the boardroom on many occasions. A gray, wraith-like figure, but definitely recognizable as a figure dressed in a costume that would have been commonplace in 1888. Annie is hardly the only Ripper ghost said to frighten this neighborhood. The ghost of Jack's fourth victim, Catherine Eddowes, is reported to haunt Mitre Square, one mile away from Hanbury Street. This is the place where Catherine Eddowes' body was found on the 30th September 1888, where I'm walking actually was two houses. But Catherine's body was found over here by the gate to Heinemann's yard, a small stable yard that stood here at the time. Catherine's murder was equally, if not more gruesome than Annie's. The Ripper mutilated her face and desecrated her body. For over 100 years, her ghost is said to creep around. People don't just see her, they feel her. And it was an horrific killing. That's why they say to this day that on the anniversary, that part of the square grows red. And people sometimes who've been on Jack the Ripper tours with me, uh, we've had people faint at that spot. And so it really is a spot that does have a sort of a, a feel to it even today. Catherine's ghost is seen laying on the ground. She's been seen by many people laying here. Sometimes people have heard screaming. And if you come to this square late at night, you do feel a chill in the air. And you feel like somebody is watching you as you walk around. 
I have no doubt that her ghost is still here and that she doesn't lie at rest. Perhaps Catherine does not rest because Jack the Ripper was never caught. Nobody actually knows who Jack the Ripper was. There have been hundreds of books written about the subject. There are tours taking place all the time about the subject, but nobody can actually put a finger on one particular suspect and say, that was definitely Jack the Ripper. The violent Ripper murders still haunt the world to this day. So if you decide to take a tour in the streets of Whitechapel yourself, don't be surprised if the ghosts of Annie Chapman and Catherine Eddowes are waiting. The cameras are set, the digital recorders ready, and energy detectors are finely tuned. Now, it's time to catch a ghost. London has been called the most haunted city in all of Europe. It almost seems the ghosts here have burrowed into every nook and cranny the city has to offer. So it's no surprise these spirits are reported to haunt another of its famous venues. The Theatre Royal Drury Lane has been an icon of the London stage since 1663. But be warned, if you come to see a show, the price of admission may include some frightening company. Drury Lane is alleged to be the most haunted theatre in London. Now, when you've got something with 350 years of history, there's bound to be an imprint of some sort from their performances and just their personalities being in the building on the very brickwork. The theatre is legendary for its harrowing ghosts. Actors have told tales of invisible hands pushing them on stage, sudden kicks after a bad performance, and dressing rooms that suddenly turn cold. There are some genuinely strange things that people have said and recorded, which it's very difficult to explain. But a team of investigators believe there is an explanation. The Ghost Finders Paranormal Society has come to Drury Lane to unlock the truth behind this haunted theater. And whatever you do, don't call them Ghostbusters. This team has been investigating poltergeists all over Britain for more than five years. We are ghost hunters. What we're doing is trying to obtain real evidence that ghosts do or do not exist and find explanations, logical explanations, for certain paranormal activity. I mean, this has got so much history to it anyway. Um, I think we can concentrate on maybe three or four of those key areas that we've identified. But this operation is no Scooby-Doo cartoon. The team uses the latest technology in their attempts to contact the dead, looking for real evidence of the supernatural world. We use lots of different paranormal equipment, such as digital voice recorders, EMF detectors, to try and measure the electromagnetic field in a location. We also use non-contact laser thermometers. Paranormal experts believe that when uh, there are cold spots, when people experience these cold spots, that could be a sign that ghosts are present. So we use that device to try and monitor that. The investigation will begin by trying to contact one of the theater's most famous ghosts, a mysterious spirit who haunts the balcony called the Man in Grey. He's called the Man in Grey because um, every time he's been seen, which has been on a number of occasions, um, he's been wearing a long grey riding cloak and a tricorn hat, like traditional 17th century dress. The identity of the man in grey is unknown, but he may be connected to a terrible crime. In the 1840s, bones and a dagger were found hidden in a wall near the upper balcony during a renovation of the theatre. The question is, was the man in grey the perpetrator or victim? I don't think he interacts with people, although it's been said that if he's been seen yeah, on the opening been, night... Yeah, the show is meant to be a... A good one. A good it? show. Yeah. It's meant to be successful. He, he's... So we've got to see what we pick up there. And it might mean we can't communicate with him. It's not very active there. So we'll just move on to another area because there is so much here to investigate. Okay. So should we, get, should we get started? Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Sure. The team heads to the upper balcony where actors and audience members claim to have seen the man in grey for decades. Barry will speak to the spirits as the other team members record any signs of activity. 
Steve, you can be filming on a full spectrum camera. T, you're going to be monitoring for changes in EMF. And we've got, there we have, look, guys. The K2 meter's going off. The K2 detector is a device that monitors electromagnetic field energy. These sudden spikes and changes in energy could be an indicator that a ghost is present. I'm calling upon any spirit persons that might be here. A man in grey, if you're here with us now, if you can hear my voice and see us, please can you come forward and give me a sign of your presence? Anything in? Yeah, just getting spikes on here, right? This went up to about 2.5 and back down again. What, random? Yeah, just... Barry speaks out to convince the spirit to make himself known. Don't be afraid to communicate with us. We mean you absolutely no harm. Tell us your story. Tell us why you're here. Are you guilty? Are you remorseful? Flashed. OK. Flashed. There you go. It's gone again. That's positive. We've got a positive answer there. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Barry decides to attempt an even more personal connection with this ghost. He comes up with an idea to allow the spirit to absorb his energy. Can you move an object in this room? Have you got enough energy to do that? If you don't have enough energy, I'm giving you my permission to use my energy now. You can take some of my energy and manifest yourself. I'm feeling kind of different. When I specifically said, can you use my energy to try and manifest yourself or give us some kind of definitive sign of your presence, I immediately became uh, overwhelmed with a pins and needles sensation. Are you touching Barry? Can you take it off me, please? OK, that's enough now. I don't feel well. We're not here to harm you, so there's no need to have a go at us. The spirit takes Barry by surprise. Draining much more energy than he anticipated, he starts to get sick and quickly realizes this experiment could be more than he bargained for. I think that the experience that I had uh, uh, on the upper stalls area with the man in grey, that is very rare. It's only ever happened to me twice now, and uh, the first time was about 10 years ago. It's, it's amazing because the sensation's exactly the same. It's right here. It's 22 degrees. Barry's one-on-one -on -one with the spirit world leaves this seasoned ghost hunter near the point of collapse. I felt sick. I couldn't actually stand anymore. At one point, I think I did collapse. London's theatre Royal Drury Lane is one of the most famous stages in the world. But much of that fame comes from its chilling reputation for hauntings. And when ghost hunter Barry Guy gets personal with one of these restless spirits, the result nearly ends his investigation. It was a risk I was willing to take at the time. And, you know, in, in hindsight, I shouldn't have done it. It really did make me feel quite bad. Barry recovers from the experience, although the team agrees they should leave this ghost alone. But their investigation isn't over, because the man in grey isn't the only spirit to haunt Drury Lane. The stage area is well known for another ghost who refuses to leave this theater, Joseph Grimaldi. It was Joseph Grimaldi who was the first physical comedian to actually put on the white face makeup with red highlights. So to the traditional clown makeup was founded by Joseph Grimaldi. He was an extremely physical comedian. He actually worked himself to death. Grimaldi had spent many years performing at the Royal Theatre Drury Lane, but he died at age 58 from a body ravaged by his intense brand of physical comedy. It's said his ghost pokes and prods actors he believes aren't working hard enough. I think it'd be better if we position ourselves all around. So the team hopes to taunt his spirit into one final performance. We're calling on Mr. Grimaldi, Mr. Joseph Grimaldi. Are you, are you here with us? Could you give us some sort of reaction, some sort of response that you're here? Joseph, can you come forward? Entertain me. I'm waiting in the audience for your final performance. 
They think Barry's last question has triggered an electronic voice phenomenon, or EVP. Oh, we've got an EVP. I don't know what it is, though. Hold on, play again. Go back. No, yeah. back further. You missed it. it there's okay. definitely a spoken word of breath of some kind yeah. um, that doesn't sound like it's one of us or crew. After the investigation, the ghost finders closely scrutinize the digital audio recordings from the stage. The results lead them to believe they did indeed make contact with a spirit. A distinct phrase can be heard immediately after Barry asks a question. Come on, Joseph. I'm waiting in the audience in your final performance. Is this the voice of Joseph Grimaldi? Barry also believes they may have captured an image of the man in gray. A photograph taken in the upper balcony reveals a strange shape in one of the seats. They've confirmed the anomaly is not a flash, and it's not a lens flare. The team agrees the audio and photograph are among the best they've ever collected. They can't confirm they've captured specific proof of Joseph Grimaldi or the man in gray, but it's clear this theater's reputation for ghosts is well-deserved. As a team, we're absolutely delighted with the results here today. The theatre all has given us some amazing evidence, some personal experiences, and a lot to take away with us. I'm pretty sure that this place is haunted. It's said London is the most haunted city in Europe, but maybe it's the world. In palaces, pubs, streets, and theatres, the ghosts in this town refuse to be confined to the pages of a history book. There's been so much drama and so much turmoil in the lives of the people who lived here that, of course, some of this is going to be held and retained within the city itself, even when these people are long gone. Whether it's a king, queen, or just your average bloke with an axe to grind, haunted London is as creepy as ever. I think for someone visiting London to actually explore and experience the places where ghosts have been seen really is a must because they take you back into the history of London and if you like, you're burrowing back in time and you're connecting with 2,000 years of history.